Let's turn to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. Uh, you all are uh, expecting, I guess, a Mother's Day sermon from me. Uh, Mother's Day is one of the hardest sermons to preach out of the year. Uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day. You can say, why is that? Well, people are di in different situations. And... Uh, you know, you want it to be a, a good sermon. You want it to uh, encourage your people. You, uh, but uh, there are so many ways that you can step on the toes of Mother's Day and Father's Day. Uh, I was talking to a, a, another pastor just a, a few days ago, and he was, uh, and both of us kind of want to just completely skip preaching a Mother's Day sermon. And he was talking about women in his church that, here in the last few years and miscarried and they wanted to have a baby and it's just like he was so afraid that you know preaching that would uh, offend them and you've got you've got women who have lost babies and, and women who have lost children uh, you've got people whose mothers have passed on uh, you've got uh, children that are estranged from their their mothers and the same thing on father's day and uh, one thing years ago I heard someone say, you know, when they, they had a, they would deal with people who had a hard time um, dealing with uh, God because they always heard of God as the Father, a Father. You know, we, when we preach, we, we, or when we pray, we will say many times, say our Heavenly Father. And in God, we always refer to Him as the Father. And they didn't have a good relationship with their Father. So when they pictured a Father, they pictured someone who was not loving and not uh, kind and, and not tender. And sometimes even mothers are that way as well. Uh, but uh, this morning, I'd like to preach on mothers and godly love. Now, we said the Bible always refers to God as the Father. Uh, even though God is a spirit and God really as a spirit is not so much male or female, but he has always given the title of the Father. When the, when the Bible refers to God, it refers to him as him or he. Uh, he's always referred to as a, as a male. And uh, many people uh, take the offensive doctrine, and they, some will, will uh, have, in the past couple of decades, tried to say that God was a woman and things, and things to that effect. Um, by no means does the Bible ever characteristic characterize. That's not even how to say it. Uh, you know what I'm trying to characterize. I need to just move on, don't I? Um, show God as a woman, but there are places in the Bible, uh, Isaiah 49, which uh, we're going to be looking at today, uh, Isaiah 66, uh, where it refers to God's love as his love for us and his love uh, specifically here for Jerusalem, for the people of Israel, as a mother's love. Uh, Jesus said uh, Jerusalem, he, he, he longed to gather them up as a hen would gather its chicks. Uh, so although God is always uh, personified in the male, the love that God shows is compared in different places to the Bible for his people as a mother's love. And why is that? Because next to God's love for us, the greatest love we ever know is from our mothers. Uh, they love us for the most part. And there, once again, that's a generalization. Like no one else ever loves us. Uh, when the rest of the world looks at us as, as nothing but knuckleheads, our, our, our mothers tend to think that we're still the greatest. Isaiah 49. I'm going to read verses 13 through 18, Lord willing. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her suckling child? 
that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, and the walls, and thy walls are continually before me. The children make haste, and the destroyers, and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. Lift up thine eyes round about, and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt short, I shall, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all as with an ornament, and bind them on thee as a bride do it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for godly mothers. We thank you for those that care for their children. Some, some mothers are mothers by nature and the children have come from their womb. Some mothers are mothers by the fact that they have come in and shown that love toward other people. I think of a good example in, in the Bible as Tabitha, as we preached on it not too long ago, who took care of the people of the church and they looked upon her as, as a mother. We thank you for godly women. Lord, help us today to Show your love on this day. Let us look to Jesus who died upon the cross, exemplifying that great love. Died upon the cross, not for his offenses, but for our sins. Was buried and rose again, and we ask that the message would be clear that any that will call upon his name, any that would trust, any that, that would believe upon his finished work would be saved. Forgive me of my sins and just enable me to preach as you would have me to preach this morning. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name for his sake. Amen. Amen. Preaching this morning on mothers, a godly love. A godly love. Mothers, a godly love. And, and um, as I've already said, the, the Bible gives examples of God's love toward us. Not just as a father's love, but as a mother's love as well. We said that a mother's love is the greatest love this side of God's love that we will ever experience. Let's look at a mother's compassion. Adrian Rogers called it a foretaste of heaven on earth. The closest love you will ever experience next to God's love. Now Israel obviously was not perfect. Israel was not um, even worthy of God's love. As none of us are. And yet God had manifested his love upon them. They, they, they sprang out from the mind of God. They sprang out from the heart of God. He, 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 he designed them as a nation, formed them as a nation, just as a child is formed by God in the mother's womb. A mother's love, a mother's compassion, God's compassion is unfathomable. The scripture says, sing, O heaven, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. Israel oft times went astray. But God said, I still love you. Israel many times even was in conflict with God. But God's love never diminished. It is an unfathomable love in that we cannot understand it. It is so great.
It is the first love. They love us first. Our mothers, God loved us. Before the foundation of the world, God loved us. Now, I wasn't around, obviously, before I was born. But I was around before my children were born. My wife had a desire for those children before they were ever conceived. She had a love for those children as they were in her womb. That love has never stopped. We love them because they first loved us. Before we even knew what love was, we received comfort. We received nurture from them. Is that not like the love of God? God loved us before we ever even knew Him. God did everything necessary that we would be born again. They loved us when we were unlovable. And you say, oh, Brother Duncan, how could you ever be unlovable? Now we can see that with God's love. We, can, we know that we're all sinners. We've all fallen short, but surely I've done things that I'm sure my mother wasn't proud of, wasn't happy with. Ephesians 2.4 said, But God is who is rich in mercy with His great love wherewith He loved us. His love for us is not based on our goodness. Or His love for us is not based on what we accomplish. I'd say my mother and my father have always been proud of me, even when I messed up, even when I was wrong, even when I did bad things. Now, obviously, they were prouder of me at, 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 at better moments in my life than others, but um, God's love is great. That, that verse in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2 talked about how we were children of disobedience. We're not always pleasing to our parents, but that love is so great. That they continue to love us. Even when we are unlovable. Romans 5, 8 says, But God committed His love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 6 says, Christ died for the ungodly. Oh, how great the love of God is. That He would compare. And the, 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 the love of a mother that he would compare their love to his. I read something this morning about a mother of a four-year-old. And for all that year, and I kind of we kind of experienced this, I, I believe, with Hannah, where when we, you know, for, for uh, a whole year, when she was three, we got a big kick because she'd, we'd say, how old are you? And she'd say, I'm three. And she'd make it two syllables. And when she became four, it became kind of an issue to convince her she wasn't three anymore. So this little boy was four years old, and uh, she was uh, the mother was trying to tell him how trying to, to, to teach him about the difference that it was going to be that he was not going to be four anymore on his birthday. It was the day before his birthday, and she said, So how old are you? Now, with little kids, usually they don't say it. They'll hold up their hand. And for a year, he'd been holding up his hand. Sometimes they'll say, This many. <coughs> I'm this many. She said, How old are you? And he held up his hand like that. She said, Now you're this, this many today. This is what you are today. But you go to bed tonight, you'll go to sleep. 
And when you wake up tomorrow, you'll be this. Do you know what this is? And he looked and he said, it's a handful. Many times we've been a handful to our parents, but yet they love us. They love us when we're ungodly. They, they, they love us. They love us sacrificially. We've already read that Christ died for us when we were yet sinners. Christ died for us when we were ungodly. You know, we understand that God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son for us. <coughs> that we would be saved. Oh, how sacrificial a mother's love is. I often think, you know, I, I never met my mom's mom. She died before I was born. Got out while the getting was good, I guess. But she died before I was born. But mom has told me stories over the years about my grandmother. She said they'd sit there at the table and they'd have piece of meat and she would cut up the meat and divide it with the kids and they had a lot of kids she divided up so that every kid had an equal portion and when she would take the fat off of that piece of meat and she put it on her own plate and she would eat the fat and let the kids have the meat and she would tell the kids this is my favorite part I love this I grew up to realize she didn't love the fat. But she was willing to take something. Willing to take something bad that they would have something good. Oh, the love of Christ. He was willing to take something bad. He was willing to sacrifice that we would have something good. They love us sacrificially. They love us eternally. Oh. The verse just hit me out of Romans chapter 8. Who can separate us from the love of God? Who can separate us from the love of our, our, our mother? How godly is that love? That No matter what we do, no matter what is said about us, no, no what matter how we fail. They love us. John 13, 1 says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, to, uh, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Jesus loved his own, loves us until the end. Now these, he's about to offer himself up for these men. And he continued to love him. These men that would run when he was arrested and flee to separate them as far as selves as far as they could. The one that would deny his name three times. Even John, who followed him all the way to the cross, never spoke up once for him. He loved them into the end. He died for them. Jeremiah says that God loves us with an everlasting love. A mother will love their child all the way to the grave. They never forget that baby. It's unfathomable. It's unforgettable. God asked the question, can a woman forget her suckling child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb, yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. What he's saying is even if a woman could forget her suckling child, and there are, there are occasions, they're rare. 
where a woman will forget their child. But that's rare. Their love is unforgetting. Their love is... Uh, somebody said the reason why God makes us so cute and adorable and lovable when we're little is so we don't, our parents don't kill us when we become teenagers. Why is that? They, they remember the goodness that they had. It is always with them. They remember the love that they had for them. It's unforgettable, God's love for us. He never forgets us. Israel was at a point there in their history where they were wondering, had God forgotten us? And Isaiah said, no, God has not forgotten you. Maybe you've been at that point in your life. Has God forgotten me? Your hardships have come upon you. It seems like you've cried out to him. And you feel like you're not getting an answer. God has not forgotten you. God never forgets his children any more than a loving mother forgets their child. Let's turn over to Isaiah 66. Verse 6 says, A voice of noise from the city. A voice from the temple. A voice from the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed and she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall the nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. I will bring to the birth and not cause, or shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord. Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God. Rejoice ye with Jerusalem and be ye glad with her. All ye that love her, rejoice for her joy with her. All that ye, all ye that mourn with her. That ye may suck and be satisfied with the breast of her consolation. That ye may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river. And glory of the, the, the glory of the Gentiles will like a flowing stream. Then shall ye suck, and ye shall be born upon her knees, and shall be dandled upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you. And ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And when you see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like an herb, and the hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants and his indignation toward his enemies. Let's just stop right there. We read the unforgettable love. Once again, God compares his love for his children. At that time, Jerusalem, Israel, he compared his love for his people as the love of a mother. They were conceived with joy and travail. As a mother has great joy at the birth of her child, she has to go through travail. I often think of Maybe I'm the only one that ever thinks of this sermon that I preached years ago on Mother's Day. My mother done told me. And I talked about some of the things that my mom said when I was growing up. It showed where she got those things from the Bible. And she often talked about 
See, that's, that's the joy. That's the joy. Right there of motherhood. You say, well, that was a distraction. No, it is a joy to have those children around. It is a joy to have them in the Lord's house. God rejoices at the children being in his church. But many of the things my mother said were based on, on biblical concepts. And I thought this might, might have been one too. So I was trying to research this and find out where it was in the Bible. But she always talked about how a, a mother passed through the valley of death when she had a baby. How she went in travail. And that's an old saying. It's not out of the Bible, but it is true that the closest many times a woman will ever come to death before she actually sees death is delivering child. The Bible does say that that travail will be forgotten when she has the joy of holding that baby. I think of one who died upon a cross years ago who went through travail. Suffered like no one suffered for the joy that was set before him that I might be born again. That I might be born anew. That I might be born into the family of God. That I might be his child. Oh, what joy. We are conceived in travail and joy. We are consoled with care. Verse 11 says that, that we receive comfort from her. Our, 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 our consolation comes. As she holds us close, as she feeds us, as we get sustenance from herself. We are comforted in distress. God says, I'll give you peace like a river. There's an old song, Peace Like a River, it was based on this verse right here. All the peace we have. Many of you might remember uh, being a child and, and going through some trauma and getting peace by, by your mother taking you upon her into her lap and holding you close to her bosom. God gives us peace and comfort in our despair. We see a mother's compulsion. Back in our text in chapter 49, verse 16, tells us, I have, behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. <coughs> you might remember as a child looking at your, your mother's hands. Those hands that held you, those hands that caressed you, those, those hands that uh, um, worked that you might have things that would be beneficial in your life. Those hands that carry us. Those hands can only carry us for a while, but we're carried in their hearts the rest of our lives. But as babies, as we would cry in the crib, they would pick us up and they would carry us. They would take us wherever we needed to go. Those hands that would console us and wipe away our tears. Those hands that would comfort us and hold us as we've already talked about. Those hands that would correct us when we were wrong. Those hands that would clean us up when we were dirty. <coughs> the hand of God is upon us. <coughs> he carries us in places we cannot go. He consoles us. He comforts us. He corrects us. Why does He correct us? Why do parents correct their children? Out of love. <coughs> Hebrews says, if he doesn't chastise us, we're not his. Oh, 
Oh, but those are the hands that clean us up. We were graven in the palms of our mother's hands. We were graven in the palms of the Savior's hands as well. Those marks in his hands. Those nail-scarred hands. Those scars are from us. Oh, the love of a mother. <coughs> and oh, the love of God. We see a mother's hands, but we also see, we mentioned, a mother's heart. A mother's love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That is true love. A mother can look at a little scrawny, big-eared kid. Not that I, I, I ever knew one. And see greater things for him than he sees in himself. They rejoice in our joy. Going back to what the mother sees. Remember the Lord saw a little ruddy-faced shepherd boy? Not only did he make him a king, he made him a father to the king of kings. He gave him an everlasting throne. Oh, what God can do because of his love. That, that love, that heart rejoices at our joy. All of our successes we have growing up and even our successes we have now. Our parents are well pleased. A kid I knew, uh, matter of fact, we used to babysit. I think I was about three years old. Grew up Christian parents. Got older. Got into the wrong things. Got with the wrong people. Got hooked on drugs. Was... was on drugs until just very recently, I think late last year, perhaps. He got away from those people. He, the Lord saved him by his grace. He's on posting things on Facebook. This, this, young, this man, I say young man, he's not a young man anymore. I guess he's probably getting close to 50. Took him a while. Took him a while. I had all the benefits of, of good parents and, 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 and church and even went to a Christian school. Took him a while. And he testifies about the grace of God. He's posting things constantly about how God, yeah. And this morning he was posting a picture of his mother, his dear mother, a, very, a woman who's very dear and close to me. She passed away a few years ago. She never got to see here on this earth her son saved. He was talking this morning as he posted this picture about how he never had a secret from her and how he always, she always loved him and she always had him and, 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 and talked to him and I'm sure prayed for him. And we don't know what people see once they pass on. We don't know how much they're aware of what's going on here. And his, his hope was he could see. She could see. She could see that God had saved him. We may never see our children saved. We may never see our loved ones saved. And be in heaven someday. Here they come, walking down the streets of gold. I said our, our, our mothers love us to the end, but don't think just because it's the end of our life that God still is not going to do a work on that child. They rejoice at our joy. They sorrow at our suffering. 
They hope for our future. Oh, the love of a mother. And how great, how great is the love of God. We see a mother's constraint. Verse 16 also says, Thy, thy walls are continually before me. Now God is thinking about the walls of Jerusalem, about her protection. But God has set walls about us as well. God has set hedges about us. And those walls and those hedges are not just... Why was he concerned about the walls? Well, the obvious thing is to keep bad things from getting in. We try to shelter our children from bad things. And yet those walls sometimes are set up to keep us from getting out into things. We put perimeters around our kids. We, we, we put things out there to keep them out of trouble. You're all familiar with Proverbs 22.6 where it says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not. It will not depart from them. That's not a guarantee that they'll be saved. It is a guarantee that the lessons that we teach them will always be with them. I'm up here this morning. I'm, I'm quoting things that my mother's mother taught her. We are to teach them about the Lord. We are to, to teach them the, the love of God. We are to teach them His laws and His precepts. They learn those things from the things that we say. And they learn those things from the things that we show. A mother's love is so great that God compares it in the scripture to his own love. Now once again, there is nothing greater than God's love. But that's the closest thing that we can compare it to. I'm thankful for mothers. I am thankful for those that have God has given children to, either by birth or by some other means. I am thankful that God has put his love in their hearts that they might love us like he loved us. To all the mothers, all the women, all those that really care. I thank God for you. And may God bless you. Would you stand? Amen. Sister Connie.